Good morning. Selamat pagi. Um, I never would have guessed that I will be standing in the front of believers, Christians, um, in the church ever in my life. Because I grew up, my, as, as Pastor Daniel said, that I grew up um, Brazilian father, Indonesian mother, at home as a kid. We never talk about God. We never pray together. We never go to church as a family. I grew up in this kind of background. So I thought as a young person at that time that I don't really need to know God. It's fine, I'm happy. When I was 14, I get a big opportunity to work as a model. So I flew in into New York with two philosophy, which is wrong philosophy, is that the first one, I just want to be rich. Second one is I want to be famous. There's a reason behind that, why I really want to pursue those two things. Which fame because I feel appreciated and love. And wealth is because I can buy anything that I want. And I really, really thought at the age of 14 when I was a teenager that these two things will make me happy. And throughout the years I work as a model, Maybe from the outside, I look happy, but actually not in the inside. It's funny that how the thing that you thought would bring happiness actually doesn't bring happiness. You know, there's a famous writer, he said, uh, G.K. Chesterton, he said, meaninglessness does not come from weary of pain. Meaninglessness comes from weary of pleasure. And it happens personally. So I realized if wealth doesn't make me happy, fame doesn't make me happy, what else can make me happy? I want to be happy. This is not fun. There's something within my heart, like a sense of emptiness, like I really want more than this. And I remember in New York City, one day of around 19, I prayed, I look at my ceiling in my bed, I say, God, the creator of universe, the one who created heaven and earth, I want to know you. The reason why I pray that prayer is because I'm so confused. It seems like I need God, but which God? I grew up in a home with, with three belief systems at home. I don't know which God, and when the way they describe what God is totally different. They don't speak about the same God. So in my prayer, I don't know to whom, but I, I, I want just the one who created the world the universe, the heaven. I want to know you. And you know what happened? Actually, nothing really happened. <laughs> you know, sometimes I wish a voice like, Tracy, this is me, or something. But that's actually not really true that nothing really happened because a few months later, a few weeks later, my agent called me and said, Tracy, would you like to move to Paris? And I thought, yes, maybe this will bring a fresh air. But that's exactly God's plan. Because in Paris, I met an Indonesian friend, and I get along with her, we hang out every day after work. And one day she asked me, hey, you should come to church with me. And I'm like, no, Sunday is my sleeping time. No, you should come to church with me. Please, 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 and not stop until I say, okay, fine. But you know, that day, when I went to church with her, I sat at the back, and I look around me, and there's a joy I've never seen before. There's like a glow I've never seen before. I'm in the industry where people put lots of makeup and glitter, and people can look amazing, but this one is a different kind of glow, different kind of happiness, different kind of like smile. It's not a fake smile. And I'm curious why they're so happy. I want to know why they're so happy. And long story short, the Lord truly answered my prayer. Because after that, through this one friend, she introduced me to more friends and more friends. And all of a sudden, like, year, like months later, I went back to Indonesia. I go to Bible study. And someone gave me cassette. Okay, now I sound old. Okay. It's just a few years ago. And they give me cassette of sermons. And they give me books. And they give me like, like information about, about, about Christianity. With, I do have lots of questions. But after months of asking and asking... And I finally found the answers that Jesus Christ loved me, that he's willing to die on the cross to save me. And by his blood, I'm cleansed. 
And no one in the world can love me as much as Jesus Christ. And that message used to be so foreign to me, become so real. Because finally I realized that there is a gap between me and God. There's no relationship between me and God until Christ come into my life. And when Christ come to my life, He give me hope that I never sensed before, never have before. And you know, life has never been not, never easy. But ever since Christ, I repent before Christ and I accept Him as my Savior, I face life with hope, knowing that the one who created me sovereign over my life. There's nothing hap ever happened in my life without His permissions. And I can be certain in the hand of God, I'm secured. And the things, the most amazing things about being in Christ, you know, as a model before, I'm insecure. I'm insecure about everything, about the way I look, the way I behave, about my family, about my friends. I'm so insecure. I put my identity in the wrong place. And Christ restored that. I am secured in Christ, not because of what I have, what I've got, what, what my name and, and where I'm from, but I'm secured in Christ because He has paid fully that I now belong to Him. Friends, I only have seven minutes to share this testimony. I don't know where you're at today, this morning, but if you're non-Christians, and you want to know God, pray the prayer that I prayed. The real God, please come into my life. Trust me, I've been on the other side. I'm extremely joyful and content in Christ. He answers the cries of my heart. He gives me hope. He secured my identity. He allowed me to join His missions. If you're here today and not Christians, I challenge you to pray the prayer and accept Him in your heart. I promise you, life will never be the same again. It's getting better. Not because it will be wonderful and good times, but because He will sustain you through hardship and pleasures. And if you're a Christian today, be that kind like my friend. Honestly, she didn't have no theology explanations when she bring me to church. She just want me to go to church. But because her boldness in asking me to go to church, I have the opportunity to see what is it like to be Christians and to seek more and to find out more. So be that kind of person because you never know. Someone next to you, someone in your office, someone at home, someone in your neighborhood, they can look so happy. They can look like they have everything in life. But if they don't have Christ, everything else is meaningless. And I challenge you, be that kind of person to share the good news of the gospel. There's a beautiful word it says in Isaiah and in Romans, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Church, get to know the good news and do share the good news to the world that needs. God bless you all. Well, thank you so much, Tracy, for sharing and for challenging us. One day she was walking with her mother in a shopping mall in Brazil, and they were passing by the mango outlet. Ladies or no, men, they don't sell mangoes. <laughs> the mango outlet. As I was passing by the mango outlet, there's a huge poster. She said to her mom, that's me. The mom said, no way. Mom, that's me. No way, it's you. Mom, that's me. Friends, for more of it, get hold of a DVD at a conference yesterday. Okay? This will really bless you about what she shared and things like this. And I think it's so important because she shared with us about the whole area image and identity that many, many people suffer from, friends. Get hold of that together with Michael Ramson's uh, uh, DVDs as well. All right? The last two days, I believe it will really challenge, bless, stretch, and expand. Okay, about God's call upon our lives and how we need to really be able to present the gospel in such a manner 
that we could really persuade people to trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Can you have a good amen for that? Amen. It's so important, isn't it, for all of us? Well, we have back again with us uh, Michael Ramsden, okay? And it's what a joy and delight it is to have him to speak to all of us, okay, in this regard here. Michael is married with one wife, three lovely kids. Uh, they live in Oxford. Michael is CEO of RZIM. And uh, God has used him in a powerful man in over 80 countries around the world, speaking both in a white house as well as white turban people. You know what I mean, okay? And all kinds of audiences that God has used him to communicate the good news of Jesus Christ. He was just recently, right, in Hong Kong speaking to bankers and people like this. So God has used him because it connects at every level of society because there was his training as a philosopher, economist at, a, at one of the highest levels. And so therefore, as a result, God has really used him to speak to hearts and lives of many, many people indeed. What I like about Michael is his burden and heart for evangelism, that at the end, to share the good news of Jesus Christ and to draw people to faith in Christ. And that is one characteristic mark, uh, really, of RZIM, which I really, really appreciate. Well, let's put our hands to welcome Michael as he comes out uh, to speak to us. He is another good blend, a good blend of uh, a Britisher and a Middle Easterner, okay? And uh, so, okay, again, good looks come from the Middle Eastern and Asian side, okay, of it. And that's wonderful about him. Church, would you reach out your hands? We're going to pray for Michael as he speaks to all of us. Again, we thank and praise you, Father, for this servant of yours. Lord, use him to speak your challenges and to draw us all in response, we ask again in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. 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 Bless you. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. And it's a real pleasure and a delight for me to, to be here with you. Now, I, um, in the middle of the night, I've um, changed slightly what I'll be speaking to you about because um, uh, I, I felt uh, led to address a question about meaning and purpose, which is what I'll be, I'll be doing here this morning. And the trouble with that is that that's going to raise maybe a few quite deep questions, and I realize it's very early in the morning. I'm also aware that my accent's going to be very strange to you, and also, uh, as you will realize, um, I can actually speak fairly quickly. Um, uh, I think my record is delivering at about a rate of 160 words a minute. That's, that's fast. Um, so, if you feel you need an interpretation of my tongue, if you buy a recording of this or you download it and you put it in your your uh, MP3 player and you play it back at 50% of speed, not only will you understand what I'm saying, but my voice will be deeper and I'll be speaking with more authority as a result. So <laughs> I, I will be doing the best I can. I, I was reminded this morning as I was preparing of a, of a lady who was at church listening to a guest speaker and afterwards she came up to him and shook his hand and she said, you know, your sermon this morning, it reminded me of the peace of God. And, and the speaker smiled, and then she said, it passed all understanding. And so, I, I'm hoping that what I say here may somehow pass through your understanding appropriately and properly. Now, this question about finding meaning and purpose in life is one that affects every single one of us in this room. It's a question that I'm sometimes asked in a variety of contexts and a variety of different ways. I can remember once um, being invited uh, by a, a young person who I had met and they said, look, I'm from, my, I'm from a particular country. She said, in the country I am in, there are very few Christians, maybe only 2,000 Christians in my country, maybe less than that. She said, I work for the family that own my country. And she said, I've been listening to these talks, I've been listening to some of the training that RZIM does, and when I go back, I will speak with the rulers and owners of my country, but I may get stuck. So if while I'm speaking to them, I get stuck, can I ask them to ring you? And uh, they can ask you their questions. And I said, I, I think that's okay. So she asked for my cell phone number, and I gave it to her, and I heard nothing for nine months. And then nine months later, I get a phone call and someone rings me up and they start talking to me. I have no idea who they are. And I'm talking on the phone, trying to sound intelligent, trying to sound like I know who I'm talking to, but actually they've said their name. I couldn't even catch their name initially. And I'm thinking, who are you? Who are you? And how did you get my phone number? And then eventually this person says something to me and I think, okay, I know exactly who you are. And when he finishes speaking to me, I say, can I ask you a few questions? And I ask him questions for almost an hour. At the end of an hour, 
he breaks down into tears at the end of the telephone. And he says, if billions of dollars could make someone happy, I would be the happiest man on the face of this earth. He says, I've met with presidents and I've met with prime ministers. I look into their eyes. I am searching for the ocean, but all I see are dirty little puddles. He said, I realize you're a busy man. If you will give me just a, a few hours of your time, I will fly anywhere in the world to meet with you. And so we agree on a country and we agree on a location and we agree on a time and a few months later we meet together. We sit down, he starts asking me all kinds of questions and again we're talking about why are we here, what is the purpose in life, what are we made for, and not as just simply what is the world we live in, but where, where, what is the context that gives somehow meaning to all of that. And at the end of it he says, you must come to my country and speak to the rulers of my country. I said, why would they listen to me? And he said, I own the country, of course they will come. So he says, the next time you are in our region, you just ring me. He says, I will arrange for you to come to our country. He says, you will speak to the rulers of the country, then I'll fly you back home. And so the next time I was in the region, um, uh, I was speaking at a conference uh, with uh, Dr. Ravi Zacharias in Dubai, I rang him, I said, I'm here. And he said, look, I said, I have a few days, I could possibly give to you. He says, that's wonderful. He says, I want you to go to the airport in Dubai. Go to the national airline carrier for our country. Go to the first class desk, give them your passport. There will be a ticket waiting for you. Get on the plane, fly over here to meet with me. Let's have three days together. And then I will give you another ticket, I will fly you home. And I said, well, that's very kind. So I go to the airport, everything is as he says. I hand over my passport at the desk, they look at it, they say, ah, oh, Mr. Ramsden, thank you very much for coming. They give me my ticket and my uh, boarding pass, and then they say, can we see your passport? And they open my passport and they look through every page, and then they say, where is your visa? And I said, oh, I, I, I didn't know I needed a visa. They said, no visa, no entry, we cannot let you on the plane. I said, please let me on the plane, I'm sure it's going to be fine. And they said, no, 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 no. You will be arrested and put in prison on arrival without a visa. You can't board the plane. And I persuaded them to change their minds because that's what I do. I'm a persuasive evangelist. I'm an apologist. So they said, okay, fine, go on the plane. At the boarding gate, the same thing happened. They asked for my boarding pass, they asked for my passport. This time there was a security guard with a gun. And he said, came to me, he said, where's your visa? I said, I don't have one. He said, I cannot let you on the plane. His hand is on like this on the gun. And so I'm very polite, he's armed. I say, I'm sure it will be fine. I'm sure this won't be a problem. And he looked at me and went, okay, go. <laughs> so I got on the plane and I'm about halfway to the country and all of a sudden a few thoughts occur to me. Number one, this country has a very bad human rights record. Many people disappear. <laughs> Number two, not having a visa is actually quite a serious issue. And number three, I can only remember this man's first name and I can't remember what his last name is. <laughs> so I'm on the plane and I'm praying for basically deliverance. I'm just praying that they won't arrest me and they'll deport me on arrival. That's my prayer. So I'm not praying to get in, I'm just saying, Lord, just please don't let me, please don't allow them to put me in prison. Just allow me to use my credit card. That's my only prayer. Okay, and I'll say to them, don't arrest me, I've got my card, I'll buy my own ticket, I'll leave the country. Anyway, when I arrive, it's four o'clock in the morning, and this is no exaggeration, as I walk down the steps of the plane, there are two men, they are wearing dark suits, black ties, and sunglasses. <laughs> and they say, are you Mr. Ramsden? And I'm thinking, it depends who's asking. And they said, uh, I, so uh, there was no point denying it, so I said, yes. They said, come with us. They put me in a car, they drive me somewhere, they put me in a lovely room, they give me some tea, they go and they take my passport away and then they come back and they say, you don't have a visa. I said, no. So one looks at the other and he says, wake up the minister, bring him down here, have him put the visa in his passport. So half an hour later, I'm on my way. And I'm there for half an hour. Uh, for, for the next three days as a guest in this country. This gentleman looks after everything. We have a variety of meetings with various different people. And at the end of it, 
we're sitting in the airport, and I have still to go through customs, I've still to go through passport, it's half an hour before my British Airways plane leaves. And I say to him, I need to go because we're going to miss the plane. And he, said, he looked at me, he said, the plane will leave when I say it can leave. <laughs> he says, I have more questions for you. And we're talking, and then eventually he says, come on, let's go. And we, we walk through customs and security. We're not stopped by anybody. We go straight onto the plane, and he sits next to me on the airplane. And I said, what are you doing? He said, it's a six and a half hour flight. I thought I'd fly with you. We can keep talking. And then I'll just fly back when we finished. These questions we ask about meaning and purpose are very deep ones. And if anything, as we become more affluent, as we become richer, the questions become more profound. When you're struggling for survival, quest ultimate questions as to meaning and purpose is not the fact that they're not there. It's just that so much of our energy is taken with the bare fact of keeping on that the amount of time we have to often ask other questions is reduced, but those questions are still there, and they're still very deep. Often, as a matter of fact, we're more realistic about them. However, as we become increasingly affluent, we run into a problem. In life, we find that the, as the number of choices increase before us, we struggle to know what to do. Now, the reason for that is quite simple. When we don't have very much, we may think that we're leading a disciplined life, but we're not leaving a disciplined life at all. Scarcity limits our choices. It hems us in. And so it channels us down a path, and we make the best job we can of it. However, once you become affluent, scarcity becomes scarce. The scarcity that normally limits our choices is at that point removed. And as we meet a rising affluence in the absence of scarcity, the question now is, well, how then shall we live? Because now I have a whole range of options before me that before I never had. And we find it exceedingly difficult to know how to live in that situation. That's why one very famous professor at Oxford University pointed out that as we become increasingly affluent, we often flood our life through consumption with a series of new rewards but this constant flow of new reward into our life begins to undermine our capacity to enjoy them. And eventually, we find ourselves at a point of meaninglessness, and this is what Tracy was talking about in her testimony right now. What do you do when you finally got everything that you wanted and all of the recognition that you hoped for, and yet it's still not enough? Where do you go from there? Now, what I would like to do this morning with you is I would just like to look a little bit about philosophically why some people have wrestled with this question about meaning, and then what I'd like to do is look at it a bit more pragmatically and a bit more morally, and then we're going to look at it finally biblically. And I hope that that flow will, will make sense to you. If you're not interested in the first two parts, it's early, you can have a snooze, and then someone can wake you up in 20 minutes uh, when I read to you from the book of Romans. But let's just deal with this question about meaning. Now, in the West, we are in crisis when it comes to meaning and purpose, because many people have concluded that there is no meaning, there is no purpose. That question, why? Why are we here? What is the purpose behind all of this? Where are we going? It is an unanswerable question. And the worst thing you can do is bother yourself by asking it. Asking the question makes you feel worse. So the solution is, eliminate the question. Don't bother yourself with it. The first person to advocate this particular philosophy was a very well-known character called Blue the Bear. You may have uh, come across him if you've seen the Walt Disney version of Jungle Book, where he's spinning around in a pool of water. Remember Blue the Bear, that nice, big, sort of cuddly bear? I, uh, some of you are very thin in this church. It's rather disturbing to me. <laughs> Life is too short to be thin. Anyway, the... <laughs> There is this bear, you know, he's sitting there, he has the little boy sitting on his stomach. Do you remember this scene? And they're slowly spinning around, and he's singing that song, The Bare Necessities of Life. If I had a singing voice for you, I would sing. Like many famous singers, I can reduce people to tears when I sing. <laughs> and as Baloo the bear spins around in the pool, at one point, he looks over his shoulder, 
And he says, don't be like that bee buzzing around looking for answers that cannot be found. Just forget about it and get on with it and enjoy the bare necessities of life. Now, how have we ended up there? Well, many years ago, a French novel was published, surprisingly in France, which was originally entitled The Diary of Antoine Roquentin. And the diary of, of Antoine Roquentin told the story of a man called Antoine, who's struggling to find meaning and purpose in life. And he is really struggling to find meaning and purpose in life. Existence seems to be a state of frustration. Why am I here? It's getting worse. He can't answer the question. One day, he's sitting outside looking at a chestnut tree. And you know what a chestnut tree is? They grow very, very big in England. They have this little spiky shell. And when it opens, there's this beautiful nut inside that looks like it's made of polished wood. You can't eat it. You, you, mean, you can't do anything with it. I mean, it looks glorious, but it is utterly useless. And he's looking at the chestnut tree and he's thinking, what is the purpose of a chestnut tree? All it does is make more chestnut trees. Why does the chestnut tree exist? And as he's looking at this, asking this question, he feels he has a moment of revelation, an epiphany. And he writes in his dictionary and his diary, without formulating anything clearly in my mind, I discovered I had found the key to existence. So here's this young man thinking, why am I here? He's looking at a chestnut tree. He's asking himself the question, why am I here? And now he feels he's had this revelation. He now knows what the key to the center of existence is. Do you want to hear what he said? Now, I know this is very early in the morning for this, but this is what he said. He said that the world of explanation is not the world of existence. Now, what does he mean by that? He's saying there are two worlds out there. There's the world of explanation that exists only in your head. In this fantasy world in your head, there is meaning, reason, purpose, truth, justice, morality. That world only exists in your mind, in your imagination. And we think about it and we look for it. Then we have the world of existence, of trees, physical things, cars, houses, science. And that's just concerned with the way things are. And what is happening is the fictional world that exists in your head, this imaginary world in which exist truth and meaning and purpose and why, is trying to impose itself on the real world where things just are. There is no explanation why, things just are, that's it. And so he decides the problem comes, he's, he's trying to make this imaginary world where he's hungering after truth and justice and meaning and purpose. He's trying to make the world that exists in his imagination fit onto the world of reality and it doesn't fit. That's what's wrong. That's his conclusion. And as he thinks about this, he begins to feel sick. Physically, emotionally, spiritually sick. Sick to the pit of his stomach. That is why when this novel was first published in English in North America, it was republished with a new one word title, Nausea, <laughs> by Jean-Paul Sartre. Because that one word, Nausea, summed up that whole book. And then it left this question, well, are, are they right? And of course, these two worlds eventually came to be described as the world of faith, in modern, in the West now, and the world of science. Which world do you want to live in, they will say. Do you want to live in this faith world, where you can believe in God, morality, meaning, purpose, truth, and so on? It exists only in your head. Or do you want the real world of fact and existence? Which world do you want to live in? You know, when I, I first used to travel around the world, and people would, I would often have invited to dinner with people and they would come and ask all of their difficult questions. And Sometimes people would say this to me. They would say, Michael, I'm so happy that you believe what you believe as a Christian. I wish I could believe what you believe, but I can't. Has anyone ever said that to you? Now, so a few of you are nodding your heads. I began to hear that in, 
in Europe, in North America, in parts of the Middle East, when, a few times when I was over in Asia, and I thought, everywhere I go, people say this to me. What do they mean? Well, that's exactly what they mean. What they're saying is, Michael, you, you, you seem to be happy. You have a joy in you that I would like to have. But the reason you have this joy is because you are a Christian. You believe in Jesus, but that isn't real. Now, what do you call people who believe things that aren't there? Feel free to be Pentecostal and yell at me now. What do we call people who believe in things that aren't there? Okay, mad people. <laughs> so they are saying, Michael, look, you are insane. But the main thing is, is that you are happy and insane. <laughs> now, I'm happy that you're happy. Uh, I'm so desperate to know that joy in my life, I too would embrace insanity just to join you. I've thought about it, but I can't do it. Wish I could. Now, how have we ended up in this place of thinking that this meaning has simply collapsed? Because we see it everywhere. I mean, I, I live in, in the city of Oxford. Oxford's filled with, with academics. It doesn't matter who you talk to, you find traces of this everywhere. I can remember several years ago sitting at a wedding. And I wasn't an important guest, so I was at you know, one of those tables you know, way, way, way far away from where all the important people were. And I was sitting with a group of people that I had never seen before and I'd never seen again. I'm sure this has happened to you, right? And so what do you do? Well, you say your name, you say where you're from, you say what you do. So we're having that conversation. So I say to the guy opposite me, you know, what's your name? Where are you from? And then I say, what do you do? He said, I'm a professor of history. I said, oh, where do you teach? He said, oh, I used to teach at Cambridge University, now I've just moved to another university to take over the head of the department. I said, oh, that's really interesting. What kind of history do you teach? He said, I teach postmodern Spanish history. I said, wow, what's that? <laughs> and he said, well, all history, you know, doesn't interpret itself. What a historian does is a historian imposes their meaning on the facts. When you read a history book, the history book tells you more about the historian than it actually tells you about history. Because the historian selects the facts, they impose their meaning, they impose their interpretation. All of history, the discipline of history, is simply people imposing whatever interpretation they want to on the facts. And I said, that's, that's an amazing idea. I said, is this an examined course at the university? And he looked at me, he said, well, it used to be an examined course, but students wrote whatever they wanted to in the exam. <laughs> I said, isn't that consistent with what you're teaching them? <laughs> of course, this is one of the amazing things about prophecy in the Christian faith. A prophet, in one sense, is a historian in reverse. But the amazing thing about a prophet is a prophet doesn't simply tell you what will happen before it happens. The prophet explains why it will happen before it happens. So when a chain of events happen, you don't have to sit around saying, what does this mean? You simply have to recognize a chain of events, the interpretation of which has already been given. It's one of the things that helped me become a Christian. Seeing this, prophecy about the coming Messiah and its historical fulfillment in the person of Christ. I don't have to debate about its meaning. I simply have to recognize a chain of events which I told would happen and the interpretation was given to me before they took place. Have you ever looked into it? If you're not a Christian, if you're wrestling in the Christian faith, let me suggest to you there's a very worthwhile study and you could probably start by coming to listen to Chris Wright tomorrow, uh, next week, is it next week? When he comes to speak here. Uh, he knows a little bit about this. Actually, he knows a lot about it. Have you ever thought how hard it is for God to meaningfully reveal himself? If you don't know God, look, just imagine you, you walked out of this building, and as you go into the foyer, you feel you have this strange experience, and you suddenly feel that you hear this voice speaking to you. This is God, believe in me. Now, how do you know that while you're sat here in this room, they are not putting a special gas into the air? and you're slowly inhaling it. And as it builds up over the course of an hour, that's why all the sermons last an hour, 
it induces these hallucinations. I mean, how do you know that? I mean, if you want to be that pedantic, go down that line, how do you know? You know, it's not difficult for someone even to claim to be God. Many people have claimed to be God in the West. I know not maybe quite so many over here, unless you're in India, where it's possible to argue that you're a God in a state of forgetfulness, but that's a whole other issue. <laughs> many people have claimed to be God. How do you meaningfully sustain it? You know the story of a psychiatrist who went to a psychiatric hospital? And this is, it's, it's a new ward, he hasn't been there before, so he's meeting all of the patients. He comes to one patient who's sitting in bed with his hand tucked under his jacket like this, and he's wearing the hat shaped like this, and the psychiatrist says, who are you? And he says, I am Napoleon. <laughs> and the psychiatrist says, that's amazing. He said, who told you you're Napoleon? And he smiled, he said, God told me. And the man in the bed next to him said, I did not. Anyone can make that claim. How do you meaningfully sustain it? How do you sustain it in a way that you can know and be sure? Well, one of the ways in which Christ meaningfully claimed, sustained his claim to divinity, to be God, was through the fulfillment of prophecy. Now, some people say, yeah, look, Jesus Christ was very clever. He manufactured his life, so it looked like he filled these prophecies. But some of these prophecies concern where he would be born and who his parents would be. That's something very hard to control on the other side of the womb. Have a look into it. Now, of course, maybe even more than this sort of collapse of meaning in history, the, the main driver behind this has been our rise of science which has led many people to conclude we just live in a world of happenings, we live in a world of events, we live in a world of brute facts. All interpretation and search for meaning is false. Now, this more extreme position has come about for a variety of ways. In science, there are three levels of explanation. In science, we look for what we would call causal explanation. And so, for example, if after I've been preaching here for an hour and 59 minutes, and all of a sudden, Pastor Daniel appears before me and puts his arm around me with two big, strong guys and they start just walking me gently off the stage. There are causal explanations in terms of the physics and the strength of the fact that I want to remain here and preach for another couple of hours and they actually want to close this down because they've already heard enough, which means that I get dragged in this way. Does that make sense? There's a, we can explain that in terms of physics. There's a causal thing going on there. The friction of my feet, the pressure they're exerting on me, that's one level of scientific explanation. Another level of scientific ex explanation is functional. So in the functional, what you're doing is you're saying, well, look here, I can give you a mathematical equation, I can model this for you, and it explains why this thing is working in the following way. Now, the final level of explanation used to be teleological in terms of purpose and why. Now, without giving you a history of science lecture, in the 60s in particular, it was felt that that third question wasn't appropriate for science to answer, so it was dropped from the discipline. So the question why, they decided, is not answerable by science. So we focus on the causal and the functional. But having dropped it, they've now concluded that maybe it's not there at all. Now, I don't have time to give all of this to you, it would just take far too long. But let me just suggest to you that even if you know the function and the cause, there may still be an explanation why. A good friend of mine who I know at Oxford very well, who's probably one of the best chefs I know, and we, he and I often enjoy cooking together, which explains a lot about my physique. He is the director of postgraduate theoretical physics at the University of Oxford which is a, a beautiful job title, and I wish it's one I had myself. So he loves to give the following illustration. He says, supposing you walk into my study in Oxford, and you see that there is a kettle boiling, and you say, why is the kettle boiling? And he responds by saying, well, there's a heat source, and what's happening is there's a transfer of thermal energy across the container wall, and that is passing into the fluid. Now, this increases the mean square velocity of the molecules, which we refer to as V squared, okay, which is proportional to the temperature T. And when temperature T reaches 100 degrees centigrade, we have a transition. We have what's called a collective phase transition, whereby this condensed liquid 
expands into a gaseous state. Is that an explanation of why the kettle is boiling? Absolutely. Or you could walk into a study and say, why is the kettle boiling? And he said, I wanted a cup of tea. <laughs> Those are both explanations. The first one helps us understand in terms of function and cause. And it's, it's a reasonably good answer that, certainly if you're O-level, A-level standard, that you could give to explain what's going on. But just because we know that doesn't mean there isn't an answer to the next question. Why? Why is the kettle boiling? Well, purpose. I want a cup of tea. Now, what science has done, and it's been a tragedy for many of us, is it's created the impression that the universe we live in is so vast and so huge, so unimaginably big, that you and I would be crazy to think there was anything special about us either existing or being here at all. A couple of years ago, I was in South Africa and I was preaching with a guy called David Block. David Block is a theoretical mathematician and a theoretical physicist. He studies the origins of the universe and is the most eccentric academic I have met in my life. And that's saying a lot, because I live in Oxford. <laughs> he spoke before me. His wife came with a series of record decks and while he was speaking, she was mixing music behind him, classical music. Now, I love rap music and I grew up in rap music. I've seen people mix decks for rap, but this was the first time I heard it done with Mozart and Bach and Beethoven and so on. It's a whole new experience for me. And as he was speaking, behind him was a screen roughly as big as the screen behind me. And the way he started was he put up a slide behind him that was filled with stars, all these little dots. And he said, do you see this? He said, I took this photograph myself with my own telescope that he has access to through his university. The film for that telescope, I'm sure it's all been digitized now, but at the time I think it was $15,000 a roll. So it's a pretty expensive camera he's got there. He said, you see this slide? He said, I took this. He said, if you were to count the stars on this slide at the rate of one per second, it would take you 2,800 years to count them all. That's a lot of stars. Then he put up a picture of what's called a cosmic pillar of dust. This is his area of research speciality. This is what he spends his time studying, these, these huge pillars of dust that exist in the universe. And I'd never really seen one before, and he put it up and it was beautiful, absolutely amazing. This pillar of dust was See, the trouble is I work in feet, 40 feet high. Do you all work in meters? Well, let's just pray for conversion. Okay, it just, it's this huge pillar of dust. And he starts talking about it, and then he walks up to the screen behind him. And he puts his hand like this to make a span. And breaking away from this huge pillar of dust, he puts his hand on the screen, there's a little wisp like that. He says, you see the distance from here to here? That's the distance, he said, across our own galaxy. So this thing is huge. Then he puts up another slide, and it looks just like the first one. All these little pictures of light, I think, oh, more stars. And he says, do you see this slide? Yes. He said, every light source you see on here is not a star, it's a galaxy. Wow. And then he put up a giant square, like this. Just a big, empty square. It filled the whole screen. And then he took out a pen from his pocket and he said, look, he said, if I gave you a pen and I asked you to draw in that square the significance of your existence in relationship to the size of the universe, how would you draw it? Now, have you ever felt very, very small? I remember sitting there thinking, we're going to have to offer counseling to everybody in this room. He said, you feel if you took your pen and you went like that and you put a tiny dot in it, you would be overstating the significance of your existence in relationship to the size of the universe, wouldn't you? And I can remember, I felt like bursting into tears at this point. And then he smiled. And then he finally, because then, the next thing he did was he recited from memory the mathematical equations for the formations of black holes. That took two and a half minutes. And then, just as I was losing all hope, he said, you know, you and I are all carbon-based life forms. 
Now, that I understood. And I know it's true because I've seen Star Trek many times. <laughs> and just as an aside, by the way, this is one of the reasons why excessive exercise is not, it's not a good idea. Global warming is a huge threat in this world we live in, and we're told that it's fueled by an excess amount of carbon in the atmosphere. Now, that means if you and I are carbon-based life forms, the larger we are, the more we are storing. <laughs> the rounder people are environmental benefactors, and all those skinny people out there who like jogging are environmental terrorists, and I'd like you to point that out <laughs> to Dr. Chris Wright when he's here next week. He said, we're all carbon-based life forms. He says, and carbon itself as an element only begins to exist when certain fundamental forces in the universe are held in a particular constant, within a certain tension. And then he quotes various Nobel Prize winning physicists and chemists and ma theoretical mathematicians, none of whom, none of which I can repeat for you. And then he simply said this. He said, in, one, in the words of one Nobel Prize winning physicist, Jastro, when speaking to a group of his fellow physicists, he simply said, we should not be surprised to observe the universe so large, because carbon couldn't exist in a universe that was any significantly smaller. In other words, the universe is the precise size it needs to be in order to permit the existence of just one carbon-based life form. This universe is not over-engineered on the size of space. It's the size it needs to be for carbon-based life form to exist. That's you and me. And then he put up his empty square behind him. And he said, how significant are you in relationship to the size of the universe? And a little stick man, you know, with the head and the body and the, filled the square from top to bottom. And he simply said, the universe is the precise size it needs to be for you to be here. What happens if we are not here by accident? What happens if we are here by design? What does it mean if there is a designer, a mind, a God behind this universe? If that is the case, meaning in life is not incidental, it is intrinsic. It means that we can go to the mind of the Creator to find out the purposes for which He put us here. Now, there is a very different reason, however, why many of us conclude that maybe life is meaningless. And it's not to do with the philosophy, and it's not to do with the science. It's to do with morality. And it's most beautifully illustrated, actually, by a writer called Paul in the book of Romans, who in chapter 7 writes the following words. He says, I do not understand what I do. He is about to talk about the absurdity that we often see in life. The many reasons, one of the main reasons why people have concluded there is no meaning in this world is not, I say, because of the philosophy so much, not because of the science, but because of the absurdity of between what we think should happen and what actually happens. Between that which we know we should do and that which we actually end up doing. In other words, there seems to be a moral absurdity that makes life meaningless, where we know what is good, but somehow we don't do it. And this is precisely what Paul speaks about. Paul says this, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but sin living in me. For I know that the good itself does not dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature. Now let me just say one word here, because some people struggle with this particular passage. They don't like it when the Bible says that you and I are not fundamentally good at the core of our existence. And all I can say to you is if you are sat here today and you honestly believe that you are perfect, that there is nothing wrong, that you are without error, there's only one way out of that state of spiritual self-deception. You must get married. Now, <laughs> for I have the desire to do what is good, he says but I cannot carry it out. For I do not, for I do, not the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, do you see his problem? You see what he's saying? Paul's saying, look, I know what the good is. That's not a problem. I know what good is. My problem is, is I don't do it. And I know what evil is and bad is. And the problem is, even though I know it's bad, I keep on doing it. But it's worse than that, he says. I want to do the good. That's what I want to do. I can look in myself and say, I want to do this. And I'm over here and I'm thinking, 
and I don't want to do this, but what am I doing? The thing I keep saying I don't want to do, I keep on doing it. The thing I keep on saying this I want to do, I don't do it. I find this law at work in me. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. In my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Let's just stop reading there. Do you hear the passion of, what, of this struggle? And can you identify with it? It's one of the reasons why so many people either give up in their Christian faith because they start off by thinking, well, I want to be a good person. I'm going to try the very, very best I can. And then they find it's hard. It starts the first day you go to work. You feel the pressure to compromise, to fit in. It's hard in relationships. It's hard in other things. It's, it's hard to know, to have the courage to speak up to, for the truth. And sometimes when we do speak up for the truth, instead of speaking in love, we speak harshly. So even though we were speaking the truth, we find ourselves having to apologize for the truth that we spoke because we didn't speak it right. Are you, is it just me or you're tracking me, hopefully? And it makes life meaningless. It makes it crazy, totally absurd. That we know what is good, we know what is evil, we are struggling to do the good, we're so attracted to the evil, the evil is so easy to do, the good is so hard to do. I mean, isn't it that the wrong way round? I was speaking with a young man yesterday at the um, conference who asked me a brilliant question, and it wasn't quite like this, but it was along similar lines. God made me this way. Look, if he made me, great. Why is it he made me, and I want to keep doing this, and he's telling me not to do it? I mean, that's crazy. And then God is going to judge me for being me. Does that make sense? Well, that doesn't sound fair, does it? If the Bible says that we're all going to do the stuff that we don't want to do, and we're not going to do the stuff that we know that we should do, and then God made us, and he made us so that we're going to do the stuff that we shouldn't do, and then he's going to punish us and send us to hell for doing the things that he said we shouldn't do, but he made us do them, then how does that make any sense? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. It seems to make all of life absurd. The analogy would be a bit like this. It would be like God coming to us and we're drowning in the ocean. And he says, you're drowning. Get out or you'll be punished. And you say, I can't swim. And God says, well, that's your problem. But if you drown and you ruin your life, I'm going to punish you for it. And then you drown and then he punishes you. Is that, is that fair? How about if you're drowning in the ocean and someone comes along and says, take my hand, let me pull you out. And you say, I'll get out on my own, thank you, it's my life. <laughs> and they say, you can't swim, are you crazy? You're gonna drown, take my hand, I'll pull you out. And you say, no, if I get out, I'll do it on my own. And then you drown. Does that change the scenario at all? It's very, very, very interesting. In John chapter 3, we have some very famous words. I'm sure you've heard them many times before. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Well, that sounds good. God loves the world. He sent him so we don't have to die so that we can be saved. We can have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But that's nice. That's good too, right? But to save it. Well, that's even better. That's saying the same thing, one negative, one positive. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Now just think about that for a minute. This is Jesus Christ speaking. Jesus Christ is speaking about why he has come into this world as God. I've come into this world to save it, he says. If you believe in me, if you put your trust in me, if you put your hand in mine, you will not perish, you will have eternal life. I haven't come into this world to make you drown, I've come into this world to save you, he is saying. Anyone who trusts in me and puts their faith in me will be saved and you will not die. I haven't come to condemn this world, 
because it already stands condemned. Why? For what are we being judged? For what are we being condemned? Because we didn't believe in God's one and only Son. In other words, we refuse to take the only rescue plan God has for this world. God has stepped into this world in the person of Jesus Christ to rescue and save us from a situation that we didn't bring about. Look, it wasn't your decision to be born. Do you, do you understand that? You know how babies are made. Look, speak to the pastor, he'll explain to you afterwards. <laughs> right? You didn't say, hey, I'd like to exist, and then pop, you, up you come. That wasn't your choice, right? And you were born into a world, most of which is outside of your control, right? And things have happened to you many of them outside of your control, right? People have done things to you and you have suffered in life for things which are not your fault. This is one of the tragedies if you ever counsel anyone who suffered abuse. Because abuse of victims, especially when they've been abused when they're children, will either respond in anger to everybody else or more commonly in anger against themselves and they blame themselves. What was wrong with me? What did I do? I must have done something wrong to deserve this. Listen. You can suffer in this life and you can know pain and agony for things which are nothing to do with you and they are not your fault. They were done to you. Now that doesn't mean that we're innocent, of course, because there are plenty of things that we have done that would make us guilty. And if you're not sure about it, ask your wife, ask your husband. So yes, we've all done things which are wrong. That's true. And we'll be held account for those too. But here Jesus Christ is saying that we may end up in a position of drowning, not because we're being blamed because we couldn't swim, but because we're being blamed because we didn't take God's lifeboat. He stepped into this world to save us. We can't save ourselves. Do you know that change and transformation in your life? It's so interesting how so many Christians Start in a position by saying, Jesus, save me, help me. And we put our lives in his. And then very quickly, we take control and begin to try to complete in the flesh what he started in the spirit. And we get ourselves back into deep water again. And we find ourselves drowning all over again. And all of life becomes a struggle and it becomes an utter misery to us. That is not what the Christian life should look like. I have a very good friend. I'm going to share a little bit of his testimony with you. After you hear this testimony, you may be tempted to Google his name. By all means, Google his name. Do not believe everything you read about him on the internet. He did not assassinate JFK, nor did he assassinate Martin Luther King. But Thomas Tarrant, who's become a very good and close friend of mine, and I'm sure one day, well, he's getting elderly now, in his late 70s, I don't know, you may be able to get him here to share his testimony in this church. It's one of the most powerful I've ever heard. But what is true is that Thomas Terence III ran one of the most successful terrorist cells in all North American history. Tom Terence was at a school in Alabama, in the Southern America, which was the first school in America to be desegregated. And they took black American children and put them on buses and bust them into his school. And he saw them arrive and he was angry about it. And he became increasingly angry about it. He felt it was wrong and it violated the natural order of things. So he was attracted to join an organization called the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. Some of you may have heard of them. But he didn't like the Ku Klux Klan because he felt they were a bit too liberal. The trouble with the Ku Klux Klan is they said a lot of talk but not a lot of action. So then he found a group called the White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Now this group he liked. Because not only were they prepared to speak about that which they felt was wrong, they were prepared to act on it. And they killed, and they arsoned, and they shot people. They set crosses on fire and pumped people's lawn, lawns. And their reign of terror grew and grew and grew. Until an American man by the name of Edgar Hoover, you may have seen, there's a film made about him recently, who was head of the CIA and of the FBI, decided that he needed to eliminate Tom Tarrance because it was becoming an irritant to him. So what Edgar Hoover did is he took a group of spies, American spies, who had been trained on how to turn people into double agents who were working in the United Nations. I'm sure this doesn't happen today, by the way. But they've been trained to work at the UN to infiltrate Russian 
groups and communist groups and turn them around to become double agents for the American government. He took that team out of the UN, sent it down to the Southern America to find Tom Tarrance's organization, infiltrate it, turn some of them around to become double agents for the government, and then they'll set up an operation to have Tom Tarrance killed. And that's precisely what they did. Now, you can read some of this stuff online because under the American Freedom of Information Act, all these documents have now been released. So if you want to read all of the history, you can. Well, they went down and they infiltrated his organization. They were very well trained. And one day, Tom Tarrance arrived in a car being driven by a 21-year-old primary school teacher to deliver a bomb into a Jewish businessman's house. And as he's walking up the drive in the middle of the night to deliver this bomb, 26 men who've been posted on rooftops and are hiding in bushes open fire and start shooting at him because they've been sent to take him out. The plan was not to capture him, the plan was to have him killed. Now, by the way, this was a very controversial operation because apparently the American CIA is not meant to kill American citizens on American soil. But there are lots of things they're not meant to do. So I guess that's okay. And just in case you're listening, let me just say how much I love you. So, <laughs> he dropped the bomb, which didn't go off somehow, and made it back into the car. Now, this does imply that these 26 men may have needed a bit more training. <laughs> As he drove away, the lady next to him took a bullet in her neck, collapsed into his lap, and died 30 seconds later. But he sped off. Now, they'd hidden cars in the houses all around the one he was trying to blow up, so as he drove away, they chased him down the street. If my memory serves me correctly, and I'll need to check, you'll have to check this online, I, I think they fired something like 247 rounds of ammunition into his car. Now, that's, that's a testimony to American engineering. Eventually, it stopped. He grabbed the Uzi on the seat next to him, and as he came out of the car, he sprayed the car behind him with bullets. The first policeman who was coming out of the car saw what was happened, and he ducked and managed to miss the spray. The second policeman was, was turning on his heel. He couldn't duck, and he took a bullet straight into the heart. Now, when the clip emptied, the first guy stood up and shot Tom twice with a shotgun. But then, instead of coming to kill him, as were his orders, he went to his partner and started beating on his chest, managed to get his heart beating and saved his life. And in that moment of confusion, Tom escaped. But he was bleeding badly. So they came with torches and they came with dogs. They found him hiding in a bush, and when they found him, they turned the lights off and they opened fire at almost point-blank range. Now, what was happening was he was lying on his side, and a lot of the shot from the shotguns was just passing over his chest. But if you ever see a picture of him with, no, with his shirt not on, you see most of his chest is missing. When they turned the lights back on, he was still breathing. They were convinced he was going to die, but one of them produced a gun and held it to his head. And at that point, an ambulance crew arrived. No one had called for them. They'd just seen the flashes of light. They'd heard the gunfire. They'd come to see if they could help. They led him into the ambulance. Everyone was sure he was going to die. Well, he didn't die. They operated several operations. They managed to save his life. Eventually, he was strong enough to stand trial. He stood trial. There was a big scandal in North America about it because of the nature of the operation. And he was sent to a maximum security prison in Alabama. Now, after six months of being in, the, in a maximum security prison, he decided he didn't like the accommodation the American government had given him. So he got together with some friends and he left. He rejoined his old unit. He didn't realize it had been infiltrated by the government. As soon as he rejoined it, they betrayed his location. And one day, he's standing guard at a camp that got in the middle of a swamp. And a friend comes and relieves him half an hour early, and he goes back inside. And as he goes back inside, there is the most enormous firefight. They came, I think, with hundreds of men, every kind of armament you can think of. His friend was literally vaporized in what happened. And then they turned on a loudspeaker. They said, you have 30 seconds to come out, or we open fire. And he knew there was no point. He came out. He surrendered himself to them. He was put back in jail. He was given another five years and put in solitary confinement. Hoover recommended he should spend every single day in solitary. Now, after a little while of being let outside once a week for just 20 minutes, he started to ask for books to read. The first book he asked to read was called Mein Kampf by a guy called Adolf Hitler. Then he started to read other books. And then eventually he thought, you know what, I should try reading the Bible. After all, he thought, I'm a good Southern Baptist. That's what we do. 
So he asked for a Bible to be brought to his cell. And he sat down and he started reading. And he got as far as where it says, where Jesus Christ says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his very soul? And Tom Tarrance realized for the first time in his life that he was a sinner. That what he was doing was wrong. That the racism he was guilty of offended God, not just other people. And he was wrong. And he got down on his knees in his cell and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. The change in his life was profound. So profound, everyone in the prison heard about it. Edgar Hoover heard about it. If you've seen the film, J. Edgar Hoover, you'll understand why he heard about it. He heard most things those days. So Hoover sent the agent who masterminded this entire operation into to Tom Tarrance with the orders to interview him and send him a personal report on what had happened to Tom Tarrance. Now that agent went on later to write his own book. From the moment he walked into that cell, he says, I knew I was looking at a different man. So profound was the change in Tom Tarrance's life that two months later, he himself became a Christian. As Tom was in the cell, he wrote to the 26 men who'd been appointed to shoot him that day, apologizing for putting their lives in danger and asking if he could meet with them. 22 of them agreed and 21 of them became Christians. On his eventual release from prison, he began to tour around North America, speaking about racial reconciliation and equality, and how wrong he had been, and how gracious Jesus Christ was. Jesus Christ changes hearts. What a wretched man I am, Paul said. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian, to have your heart changed. Is that what it means for you to be a Christian? Is it possible you've thought of yourself as a Christian, you've been raised in a Christian home, but you know you have never met Jesus Christ and had your heart changed? Is it possible that you have met him, but instead of continuing in the power and the life of Christ and the Holy Spirit, you've decided to try to do it your own way, in your own strength, and you're struggling, and it's feeling meaningless. You even come to this church and you think, what is the point of all of this? All of this singing, it doesn't seem to change anybody. All of this worship, it doesn't change anybody. All this, it's not changing. Well, it may not be changing you, but to anyone who gives themselves over to Christ, he changes. Are you in a position where you need to come back to Christ this morning and say, God, I need you to change my heart, my life. I need you again. I'm finding myself in deep water and I'm in danger of drowning. Please, God, I turn to you. Forgive me again. Give me your strength. Give me your power. Renew a, your, this heart within me and fill me with your spirit once more. Is it possible that you're not simply so much drowning as you're just struggling? Everything in life has become so hard. You're questioning what is the purpose. You're questioning what is the reality. You're questioning the significance of your existence. You do feel totally small. You need to know that Jesus Christ loves you. You, values, you, has died for you, wants you. Look, this is my wedding ring. It's a small band of metal that cuts off your circulation. <laughs> now, the person who sold it to me told me it was gold, apparently 18 karat gold, that's what they said. Now, I'm an economist. In economics, this has value for one and one reason alone, and it's not because it's scarce. Everything is scarce. Everything's finite in this world. Plastic is finite. The reason this has value are people are prepared to pay for it. If no one wanted gold, if no one was willing to buy gold, if no one needed gold, what would the value of this be? The answer is zero. In economics, something only has value and there's only demand if someone's willing to pay for it. That's how you measure demand and that's how you determine value. And if no one's prepared to pay, then it has no value. If you are struggling to know your value in the eyes of God, you need to understand this. If gold exists, do you think it means anything to him? 
The price that God was prepared to pay in order to save you, rescue you, redeem you, is the highest possible price he could have paid. He himself came into this world in the person of Jesus Christ and the fulfillment of prophecy. He himself is the one who made you. And even though we now find ourselves born into a broken world that has broken us and we've done things in response that we should never have done and we're just as guilty as everybody else, he loves us. And he was willing to give his life to die for you and then he was raised in your life to give new life to you. The price that Christ paid on the cross is the highest possible price he could have paid. He gave himself because he wants to know you. Do you need to turn to him again this morning? Well, I'm gonna invite the musicians back up here and we're gonna offer the chance to pray with you. Maybe you would like prayer because of a, just a particular situation you're praying in your life and you wanna come forward for no other reason then you are broken and you are hurting, whether it is physically or emotionally or spiritually, and you just want someone to pray with you and say, can you just stand with me in this and pray with me? Maybe you would like someone to pray with you this morning, and I'll be down here at the front praying with people too, because as a Christian, you found yourself in water and you find yourself drowning again, and you just need God to help lift you out of that and set you aright. Or maybe it's possible that you don't know him at all, and you're listening to this and you're thinking, I I, I need to know you. This I need in my life. Well, I'd love the privilege of praying with you to become a Christian this morning. And know there'll be rejoicing in heaven as there is. Could we invite you all to stand? The band behind me are going to play. Pastor Daniel's going to come back up here on the stage and lead this time of, of response and maybe share a few other words. But if you need prayer this morning, You know that God is asking you to respond, that this is an opportunity for you. If you're in the balcony, feel free to just come up, come back down. If you're down here, come forward. There'll be people standing down here on the ministry team to pray with you. I will be down here. I'm gonna come down as well as the pastor comes up so I can pray with you too. It'll be our privilege and our joy to pray with you. May God bless you and thank you for giving me a hearing.